collapsed. Lower Manhattan is evacuated New York as never before. And a third hijacked airliner hits the Pentagon in Washington, epicenter of America's defense. A fourth crashes in Pennsylvania. Good evening. Terrorists have struck at the financial and military heart of the world's superpower. The global financial capital of New York is at a standstill. The federal government has shut down. All its offices in Washington have been evacuated. The president has been flown to a military base for safety, well away from the capital. Four passenger airliners were hijacked in the operation tonight. The moments of panic as fire engulfed the World Trade Center's towers. The scene on the ground as New Yorkers fled the collapsing buildings. In Washington, the very Pentagon itself under attack, the White House evacuated. As smoke billows around the nation's capital, who did it? And what can President Bush do now? Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. An unknown number of casualties in an atrocity beyond anyone's comprehension. Tonight, America is a country sealed off from the rest of the world, with all international flights grounded, all land borders closed. The four attacks were launched with frightening speed first thing this morning. Just before 9 a.m. New York time, a hijacked jet smashed into one of the twin trade towers in New York's lower Manhattan. At 9.18, millions watching television pictures of the first blaze saw another plane crash into the second tower. As panic spread throughout New York, another hijacked plane slammed into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., home to the Department of Defense. Then a car bomb exploded at the Department of State. A hijacked American Airlines jumbo jet from New York to San Francisco also crashed near Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. The World Trade Center was at the heart of New York's financial district. 50,000 people worked there every day. At seven minutes past 10 New York time, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. 20 minutes later, it was followed by the North Tower. The cost in terms of human life is impossible to calculate. President Bush vowed to hunt down those behind the attacks. He said, Terrorism against our nation will not stand. World leaders from Tony Blair to Yasser Arafat have expressed their outrage. Lindsay Taylor now reports. At first, no one can believe it, but it's all too real. The World Trade Center in flames, smoke spewing from the upper floors. A gaping hole in one of the center's two 110-story towers it's been caused by an aircraft crashing straight into it. It seems initially as though there's been a terrible accident. But as the American TV networks struggle to make sense of what their helicopter camera crews and eyewitnesses are depicting, senses are suddenly challenged beyond imagination from the right of the picture. The, um, I'd say the hole takes about, about six, seven floors were taken out. And there's more oh, there's, explosions oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Wait, so hold hold on. on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. The building's exploding right now. you got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. Okay, just uh, put, put Winston on pause there for just a moment. Okay, while the he... whole building just exploded some more. The whole top part. Okay. The building's still intact. People are running up the streets. Uh, am the... I still connected? It happened so fast it was at first unnoticed. But before the world's eyes, a second plane has plowed directly into the center's other tower. With such images come a sickening dawning. One such plane crash might have been an accident. Two must be deliberate. One of the USA's greatest institutions has been deliberately targeted. America is under attack. As we're fixated by the images of the burning buildings, it's impossible to imagine what is happening inside. Two relatively large passenger jets disappear inside the huge structures. The casualties must be enormous. Both planes were passenger aircraft and were full of people. Then, images that will haunt for years to come. On some of the floors, survivors of the initial impacts appear at the windows. 
Their exit's blocked by the destruction and carnage inside. All they can do is signal for help. They can see and smell freedom, but no one can reach them hundreds of feet up. With events to come, it's unlikely any of these people will survive. Around this time, President Bush vows to hunt down those responsible for the atrocity. But even as he speaks, it emerges that the US Capitol has also been hit. The Pentagon in Washington, nerve center of the US military, struck by another crashed passenger aeroplane. US establishments had increased security since the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, but it wasn't enough to prevent this, a series of blatant and seemingly unstoppable attacks. The FBI had been investigating a series of hijacks today, but by then the planes were already close to completing their deadly missions. This is the worst nightmare for the US security establishment, a strike at the heart of government and the people. But back in New York, it's not over. The first of the Trade Center towers collapses like a house of cards. Gone are the hopes of escape of those who survived the initial impact. Hundreds of tons of masonry falling to the ground where emergency service workers, onlookers and others have been trying to help. Everything just went black. Everything came down, glass started popping. People got hurt, stuff went on top of them. And it was a big explosion and everything got dark, real dark like snow. You can see behind me, oh this is not snow, this is all from the building. It was a terrible nightmare. Then the second nightmare. If there was panic before, it's now out of control as an already appalling situation gets worse and worse. At a stroke, the streets of the most powerful and well-defended nation in the world are filled with fear. It's still not known who carried out such attacks or what motivation there could be for crashing planes full of civilians into skyscrapers full of people going about their lives. It's estimated the numbers of dead will run into tens of thousands, but no one yet really knows. No one can take in the enormity of what has happened. No one has the experience of dealing with death and destruction on this sort of scale. No one knows why it happened, and no one knows quite how America will respond. Lindsay Taylor reporting. It is a war zone, chaos everywhere, people crying and screaming. New Yorkers describing the sheer panic of the horror wreaked upon their city. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani said a horrendous number of lives had been lost. Hospitals in the city are said to be choked with casualties short of blood, queues of people waiting to give it. Krishnan Guru Murthy reports now on the day's terrible events in New York City. On the ground just after nine o'clock, the people of Manhattan still had no idea of either what exactly had happened or what was about to happen. Move it, come on! At this stage, two aircraft had crashed into the World Trade Center towers, but nobody imagined they could actually collapse. So I was right there, I was, in the I was down in the basement, came down, all of a sudden the elevator blew up, smoke, I dragged the guy out, his skin was hanging off. I was just standing here watching the World Trade Center after the first, after the first plane hit. I just saw a second plane come in from the south and hit the south tower halfway between the, the bottom and the top of the tower. It's got to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. Office workers streamed out of the area, traumatized, many with no idea what had happened to their colleagues. And then we heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out, and we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people are jumping out the windows over there they're jumping out the windows i guess because they're trying to save themselves i don't know and and i don't know everybody just doesn't know where to go they won't let everything is blocked off you can't even they're telling us to get out but there's nowhere to go
then the unimaginable. Police, fire and ambulance workers all caught together with those still trying to leave the area as one tower collapsed, spraying tons of concrete, metal and other debris hundreds of yards. Some water. Get the cameras out of here. Let's go. Get off now. Go. With no idea how many new casualties they were leaving behind, many rescuers simply had to run for their lives, as did those trying to cover the unfolding scene. All the traffic, all the people traffic was running up. And I'm looking up, I'm trying to call the station, trying to find where we are. And I look up and the tower just starts crumbling down. And everybody in the street just stops and started crying and bawling. And I'm standing next to a fireman, he said, yeah, they just bombed the Pentagon, too. The immense scale of this attack was becoming clear to the watching world. But down on the ground, with phone and power out, coordinating the response was already near impossible. Evacuating the complex web of densely packed buildings, painfully chaotic. We tried, went, tried to do a floor-by-floor -floor search, New York City police, the fire department, Port Authority police best they could tried to get everybody out but as you know uh, there were people still coming out after that building came down do you have any idea how many people would normally be in the building at 8:30 or north this is the director of the there are probably uh, 10,000 people in each tower 10,000 people in each tower would be, typically be in there on a normal business day and we get about another 5,000 visitors during the course of the entire day mm -hmm. so by 8:30 9 o'clock the building should have been full New York's emergency services were overwhelmed. Even now, there is frankly no idea of how many casualties there will have been or how many dead. It was election day in New York. The mayor, Rudy Giuliani, suspended them and advised New Yorkers to stay calm. To see uh, what happened there is, of course, it makes you very, very angry. Uptown, in an amazingly unscathed Times Square, the city watched in horror on the big screens. I've never had a feeling in the city like this. Everybody is, like, frozen. I mean, this is like, if they can do this, what's next? I... He has perhaps articulated the fears tonight of America. No, 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 no! <laughs> Krishna and Guru Murthy reporting... This catastrophe has left the whole of America in shock and on high alert. One leading senator said it was the second Pearl Harbor, just as devastating a blow to America's security and national pride. Mark Easton reports now on a day which has wrought terror on the world's superpower. The Pentagon, symbol of America's military might, powerless to defend against this coordinated terrorist assault on the United States. A hijacked plane was crashed deliberately into the building within an hour of the World Trade Center crashes in New York. The explosion caused extensive physical damage to the Defense Department. Five floors collapsed as firefighters tried to restrain the fierce blaze which raged through one side of the building. The impact was on the Army section of the Pentagon, where some of the U.S.'s most senior officers would have been working. Billows of smoke drifted over the Potomac River towards the U.S. capital, Washington the most powerful city on the planet, now in panic. I'm actually astonished, I'm scared to death, and I'm praying for all of us. This would, had to happen, as long as we're going to let people off the hook in the Mideast, uh, Iraq, Iran, and places like that, when they blow up uh, buildings in Beirut and places like that, if we don't take a strong stand, this is gonna continue. Before the full scale of the attack was known, President Bush, on a visit to Florida, made it clear he wanted revenge. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and I've ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families, and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. The government of the USA effectively came to a halt as thousands of workers were moved out of strategic buildings. The departments of justice and state, the treasury building, the capitol building, the CIA headquarters and the White House were evacuated. 
The Pentagon, too, was partially evacuated, although its very design was created to withstand an attack just like this. Command and control functions could be moved to another section within the Defense Department. This evening, it was announced that the USA is now on a war footing. President Bush has cancelled plans to return to Washington and has been flown aboard Air Force One to the safety of a military base in Louisiana. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. The U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, currently in Peru, has been in constant touch with the president. They can destroy buildings, they can kill people, and we will be saddened by this tragedy, but they will never be allowed to kill the spirit of democracy. They cannot destroy our society. They cannot destroy our belief in the democratic way. It wasn't just New York and Washington which were targeted. Two United Airliners carrying a total of 110 passengers also crashed, one outside Pittsburgh, the other in a location not immediately identified. The terrorist attacks have crippled the infrastructure of the entire nation. The air traffic control system has been shut down. All airports in the U.S. and Canada have been closed. This evening, orders came through for all U.S. land borders to be blocked. The Wall Street stock market has been suspended. Strategic buildings across the continent have been evacuated. And millions of phone lines on the East Coast have been crippled. Tonight, America is in shock. Panic fills the air. Thousands are dead. Millions must mourn. In the history of the United States, there has hardly been a day as black. Mark Easton. James Rubin, President Clinton's Assistant Secretary of State, is in West London. General Sir Michael Rose, who commanded the UN Protection Force in Bosnia, is in Bristol. Professor Paul Rogers, a terrorism expert, is in Leeds. James Rubin, I want to take you to the office that you occupied, the State Department. Um, it's evacuated. Every single one of your colleagues has been evacuated. Uh, this is something unimaginable. Well, it really is. Uh, I think all of us who served in government understood that Washington was always, in a sense, a target. We took certain steps to protect ourselves. But every day I looked out of my window at the State Department, I, I never dreamed that uh, a group of terrorists would be able to uh, so completely affect the uh, United States by destroying these buildings in, in New York and now obviously by trying to attack Washington itself. It's certainly the worst terrorist incident in history, uh, but I believe it's an attack not just on the United States. An attack on the World Trade Center is an attack on all the civilized countries of the world and all the civilized countries of the world should see it that way. Was this a scenario, a terrorist scenario beyond anything that had been planned for? Well, I, I don't think that uh, this is beyond imagining. I think it's certainly beyond what anyone expected. Uh, we had seen the World Trade Center attacked before. It, an attempt was made to blow it up. Uh, so we knew that uh, at the time there were discussions uh, when certain of these terrorists were brought in for indictment that they had tried to uh, take over a number of aircraft uh, and conduct spectacular raids. So I, I don't think it was beyond the uh, imagining, but I, I don't recall this particular scenario being discussed as one we, we had expected. I wonder if you can put yourself back, cast your mind back to when you were in office. How do you think your colleagues who are still working there are actually feeling? What are they going through, do you think? Well, government in a crisis is an extremely stressful enterprise, even without the kind of uh, threat uh, to the United States directly. Uh, I remember very stressful moments when the United States was in conflict in Kosovo, for example. But that pales in comparison when you know that somebody, your family members or friends or colleagues uh, might well have been in those buildings in, in New York and to watch them collapse before your very eyes uh, on the television set really brings home uh, the power of uh, terrorists to uh, damage the lives of free peoples. And we are a free people, and it's because we're a free people that terrorists can operate. Uh, it's not a closed society, and it's one of the 
privileges, but also the pains of being a free people, as all of your viewers here in London know from the period of terrorism here in London. Uh, James Rubin, stay with us for a moment. I'd like now to move to General Sir Michael Rose. Um, Sir Michael, you only know, in a sense, what we know. I mean, we have this uh, overview of what's happened, but we don't have the intimate detail, but I think we've got a pretty good idea of what's happened. What's your kind of military assessment of uh, what has actually happened? Well, I think, in a way, we need to go uh, forward, and although inevitably there will be uh, uh, analysis of how these attacks happened and what we could do to stop them happening again in the same way, I think we need, once the natural feelings of uh, horror and revulsion of these terrible events today uh, have passed by, we need to step back and look at the long-term strategic consequences uh, of these events, because what is certain is that the world will not be the same place again in the future. And I think we need to take a, a considered view about how we're going to respond. I think striking out with cruise missiles at uh, suspected targets around the world is the last thing we should be doing at the moment. Well, no, I mean, the, the, we, what we seem to know is that this was a coordinated attack by at least four hijacked airliners. Uh, the very fact that an airliner can be hijacked, can be driven at a target, that the captain can be made to do it, although our sense is that perhaps in Pennsylvania the pilot may have crashed the plane deliberately to prevent taking it into Washington, uh, a great act of heroism perhaps, we don't know, but uh, surely this is displaying a level of sophistication that even you must have doubted existed within the terrorist fold. Well, I, I think it is a surprise that, that a group of people were able to achieve these uh, terrifying uh, events which do have long-term strategic consequences without any uh, advanced knowledge amongst intelligent communities around the world. Also questions are going to have to be asked as to how the weapons were got on board these aircraft, because my own view is that the pilots didn't uh, fly into these buildings with guns held to their heads. They were probably killed, and the suicidal uh, terrorists then took over the controls and flew them in. Uh, and as you say, one, it didn't work in one case. Uh, but there's a whole lot of immediate questions that need to be asked. But standing back a bit, uh, I think the strategic imperatives uh, are altered dramatically. Uh, I think, the, first of all, uh, defense uh, uh, organizations around the world uh, need to reassess their priorities. Since the end of the Cold War, we've been embarked on a whole series of very uh, uh, honor honorable peacekeeping operations, humanitarian intervention operations, and only a lip service has been paid to the threat uh, of uh, weapons of mass destruction being used by terrorists, or as we see here, normal uh, items that are available to everybody in a day-to-day -day life, modern society, being used to destroy uh, the center of the commercial uh, center of the world. But what does that mean in practice? Because, I mean, actually getting into the mind of a terrorist and, and devising mechanisms to, to stall him or her uh, is a very tall order, and one which has defeated many people before us. Well, of course, there's no such thing as total security, but I think we can do a whole lot better uh, than we've been doing in the past. I, as I said, I think only lip service has been paid in the past. I think we should be investing a considerable, uh, a greater effort in gathering intelligence, uh, both human and technical. I think we can put in place a lot of technical devices, uh, better ones, uh, to prevent these sorts of incidents happening because it'll be more difficult for terrorists to get uh, on their weapons onto airplanes, etc. What, 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 about, what about the missile defense shield? That comes into play in this? Well, I think the missile defense shield's got absolutely nothing to do with any of this. I, I think it's taken the eye off what is, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair said, uh, the modern uh, uh, evil of terrorism, mass terrorism. And I think he needs to focus his mind on that. He needs to put the resources in to his own defense and foreign policies, which will produce better responses uh, than we've had hitherto. And I know that d democratic countries, freedom of movement, the globalization of world markets, all these things make it terribly easy for the terrorists to do this. Right. But, it, but we must address the problem. Well, stay with us too, please. Let me just turn now to Professor Paul Rogers. And your business is more peace than war. And I'm wondering whether, uh, from your perspective, looking at peace studies, I mean, how on earth does the world gird its loins against uh, this kind of action? I think with terrible difficulty. There was an assumption when the Cold War ended that we would move into a more stable, more peaceful world. Instead, over the last 10 or 12 years, if anything, there has been greater instability and more violence, particularly in many parts of the Middle East. There has also been an assumption that very powerful uh, military states, the Western liberal democracies, could defend themselves and could maintain order. 
And with, uh, what we've seen today with these terrible pictures from the United States is that there is something terribly wrong with that analysis, and we don't seem to have a real handle on the real way the world is going. So, I mean, in, in practical terms, w where do you see the great change of emphasis coming, and how is it manifest? I think one of the things we have to recognize, and it's terribly difficult to say it at a time like this, is that there is bitter anti-Western feeling in many parts of the world, especially in the Middle East. Um, we can, of course, condemn this terrible atrocity, this series of atrocities today, but if, as I think uh, Sir Michael said, we respond just in a kind of blind retaliation, we're not even beginning to get an idea of what is ha actually happening in the world and the way the divisions are actually deepening. It's not the time to be talking this way in many ways because we have so many people who've died and so much suffering. But the worst thing that could happen would be for a kind of increase in the polarization consequent on this terrible disaster. We have to stand back and try and work out what are the root causes of the motivations of such people and what are the environments from which they come. If we don't do that, the net effect will be more of this kind of disaster in the future. James Rubin, when your president, Clinton, was in the White House, uh, Sudan was bombed for a much lesser violation than this. Uh, what does President Bush do? What do we think he'll do? Well, obviously, uh, I would be speculating. L let's assume that Osama bin Laden, who is the prime candidate whose uh, supporters and other groups have been talking about these kind of spectacular attacks on the United States for some time, let's assume he was responsible. I don't accept the idea that the answer to that is to change our policy on the Middle East, as your previous guest suggested. The answer to that is that these are evil men. These are people who are put to death, tens of thousands perhaps, of innocent civilians from all over the world who might have been in the World Trade Center. And those evil people need to be rooted out directly. And military force should not be uh, ruled out. And just because uh, the cruise missile attacks in the past weren't successful in deterring a second attack, but I think we have to be very, very clear that this is an attack on the United States of massive proportions, and the idea that the United States is not going to respond, find out who was responsible, bring them to justice or destroy them, uh, is not serious. But very briefly, what about attending to the discomfort and the distress of the people behind whose skirts these terrorists hide? Um, surely there has to be a greater engagement. If anything, surely at least since uh, Bill Clinton left the White House, there has been a lesser engagement. Well, I, I don't think this is a time for me to be criticizing my president. But I will say this. There are plenty of things we can do in the Middle East to improve the situation. But at the height of the peace process, when President Clinton was shepherding uh, the Prime Minister of Israel and the uh, Chairman Arafat towards a, a, a permanent peace, Al-Qaeda, the organization of Osama bin Laden, was still operating. Even when the Palestinian people were 80 percent against suicide bombers because the peace process was bearing fruit, the Al-Qaeda organization of Osama bin Laden was operating and trying to conduct these kind of organizations. So changing our foreign mm -hmm. policy to make it more palatable to some in the Middle East is not going to change the minds of James, these madmen. James Rubin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, General Sir Michael Rose, thank you too. And um, uh, Professor, if you would stay with us, please, uh, we'll be looking a little later at who really may have perpetrated this atrocity. And um, uh, Professor, if you would stay with us, please, uh, we'll be looking a little later at who really may have perpetrated this atrocity. Well, we just got uh, further pictures of the scene now in Pennsylvania. The plane which crashed about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. One local politician said it was apparently intended to hit Camp David, which is the presidential retreat in the state of Maryland. The plane was the United Airlines Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco with 38 people on board. We'll be giving you an emergency phone number at the Foreign Office later in the program uh, for relatives to contact uh, them in case there's any anxiety about people in New York, Pennsylvania or anywhere else. You're watching Channel 4 News tonight, dominated by the terrifying attack on the United States. It began first thing this morning when a hijacked passenger jet smashed into one of the twin trade towers in New York. As smoke billowed into the skies, another plane was flown directly into the 110-story tower. 
as office workers ran for their lives, the South Tower collapsed. And then the North Tower, sending debris and rubble showering over the whole of Lower Manhattan. The number of casualties is still completely unknown. In the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., yet another hijacked plane slammed into the Pentagon, home of the Department of Defense, the heart of America's military power. Tonight, as President Bush bowed to hunt down those responsible, the entire country in shock. All international flights are grounded, land borders are sealed, and major buildings across the country stand empty. So what went wrong with America's airport security that allowed four planes to be seized from across the United States? Julian Rush looks now at how an attack on the heart of American finance, politics and military power could have been carried out. Even as America reels, the questions begin. The terrorists' targets were well chosen. The Twin Towers, symbols of the American dream, of America's wealth and economic global domination. Symbols, it turns out, that were uniquely vulnerable. Remember, each tower is 110 floors. Maximum population, a staggering 50,000 people. What were the evacuation plans for so many? Just how do you fight a fire 400 meters above the street? And no skyscraper was ever designed to withstand this. The combination of the impact of tons of plane and the explosion of the fuel aboard, a fatal blow to the concrete and steel structures. Impossible, say engineers, to design a building to survive that. Well, what, what's interesting is that the building withstood the plane impact, but it's a subsequent fire. The fuel would have poured through the building and, and ignited, and as you see, as you've seen in the film, set fire to the building. And as that fire took hold, the steel structures of the buildings got hot, um, they softened as they got hot, and the building just basically couldn't support the, the weight of the, the, of the floors above it, and they just then collapsed down, and the whole building you know, unfolded, as you see in the pictures, like a pack of cards, just collapsing in a surreal way. And it seems it was all too easy for the hijackers to get on board. The hijacks were all internal flights and chosen with precision timing. American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston for Los Angeles with 92 on board, the Boeing 767, had been due to take off at 7.45. Fifteen minutes later, United Airlines Flight 175 took off, again from Boston for Los Angeles, again a 767, carrying 65 people. At the same time, in Newark, near New York, United Airlines Flight 93, a Boeing 757 to San Francisco, took off with 45 on board. This is the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. And then at 10 past 8, American Airlines Flight 77 from Washington to L.A., that took off with 64 on board. For internal air travel in America, it's just like catching a bus. Security checks are very few. There's been concern for some time that civil aviation in the U.S. is insecure. Um, it's not possible to check all passengers on flight. It's not possible to close all of air, all airspace over sensitive areas. So there certainly have been advocates in the U.S. security community saying that this is a disaster waiting to happen because U.S. Uh, domestic airlines are so easy to hijack. Unfortunately, they may well now have been proved right. Then there's the intelligence failings. Why did no one know? The USA has the world's biggest intelligence operation. It spends billions on high and low-tech surveillance. These attacks give the overwhelming impression of precision planning. They're already being compared to Pearl Harbor, a wake-up call before a war. But against whom? And to strike at the heart of America's military might. The Pentagon is one of the world's most secure buildings, but it seems desperately vulnerable from the air. George Bush thought attacks from rogue states would come from missiles son of Star Wars, is impotent against hijacked commercial jets. The US has stopped various attacks like this in the past. Um, there's several times they've stopped audacious attempts like this at the last minute or through intelligence operations uh, or indeed through preemptive arrests or preemptive strikes. But the point is with terrorism, as the IRA once said, terrorists only need to be lucky once. Uh, the security forces need to be lucky a hundred times. And what if, like the Oklahoma City bomb, it turns out to be the work of maverick militias and not connected to the Middle East at all? America was convulsed by introspective self-examination when Timothy McVeigh planted his bomb. It's a scenario American citizens must surely find too awful to contemplate. Freedom itself was attacked this morning, and I assure you, freedom will be defended. So declared President Bush, 
But can he track down those who carried it out? Our foreign affairs correspondent Gabby Rado looks now at the build-up to the assault and questions who might be behind such horrendous events. The World Trade Center was the target of a previous attack in 1993. It was a bomb on that occasion, planted in the car park underneath the towers, and six people were killed. The investigation which followed led to a group led by a blind Islamic militant called Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, who was later jailed for life. A document found in the Sheikh's apartment linked him to the man who then became America's public enemy number one, Osama bin Laden. Only three weeks ago, bin Laden warned from his hiding place in Afghanistan that there'd be an unprecedented attack on America and its interests. To be able to take out the US uh, World Trade Center and the Pentagon is almost a, a gesture or an operation or twin operations which demonstrate, in a sense, the wrath of God. It's apocalyptic in its ability to demonstrate Islamist power to fight America. Though the Taliban regime in Afghanistan this afternoon denied that bin Laden was involved, the U.S. Embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam three years ago have been the only recent example of coordinated, virtually simultaneous acts of terrorism. The combined death tolls 264. Tragically, that figure is likely to be dwarfed by today's catastrophic events. On the previous occasion, the U.S. hit back hard bombing targets in Afghanistan and Sudan linked with bin Laden. Osama bin Laden has demonstrated the ability to launch two attacks simultaneously across vast distances through third countries involving a number of different technicians, some trained in bombs, some trained in transportation, others capable of doing um, surveillance over an extended period of time and to be able to deliver those bombs using very, very uh, simple primitive means right into the heart of embassies. He's demonstrated that. Among Palestinians, there was a certain amount of celebration of the attacks, though it's not clear the full horror of the likely death toll was understood. There was an apparent claim from the Democratic Front for the liberation of Palestine that they were behind the atrocities, but it was later denied. The mainstream Palestinian leadership offered condolences. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Five hours after the cataclysm, and no evidence of who caused it. It's premature to blame Osama bin Laden with any certainty. Anyway, he's never admitted responsibility for any acts of terrorism. And at this early stage, it's probably unwise to assume without question that the perpetrators are a group connected with the Middle East. Gabi Rado reporting. Well, with me is Abdul Bari Atwan, editor in chief of the Palestinian newspaper Al Quds. And uh, joining us again from Bradford University uh, is Professor Paul Rogers. Uh, Abdul Bari Atwan, the first finger of suspicion, and uh, you are an editor of a Palestinian newspaper, I should have pointed out, um, goes to bin Laden in Afghanistan. You've met him, you've interviewed him, could he have done it? Well, he could. Maybe he could not. Maybe it is a work of a consortium of many Islamic fundamentalist organizations. The anti-American feeling in its peak now in the Middle East. Uh, many uh, columnists, many writers, many politicians actually urge to attack the American interests simply because the Americans are taking the side of the Israelis and they are blessing what's happening now in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So maybe Bin Laden and other uh, organic, uh, Islamic organizations try to cultivate this feeling, try to actually to direct these attacks against the United States. You say politicians have urged an attack. Oh, Could yes. a government have been involved? Could a government have facilitated this? No, I don't believe so. You know, most of the Arab governments actually pro-American governments. Either they receive uh, financial aids from the United States or they receive military protection from the American navies and troops. So I exclude any um, Arab governments in this case. What about but further east? What about uh, Iran? What about uh, uh, Taliban, Afghanistan? Probably well, actually, run not these days. Uh, I don't believe so. I, um, the Iranian, the Libyan, even the Iraqi are really seeking uh, a dialogue with the United States uh, administration in order to actually lift the sanctions against them. So maybe it is, it is the work of dissatisfied uh, Islamic organization. And we know Osama bin Laden blessed all the attacks against the American embassies or the destroyer American coal and uh, sea port of Aden. Uh, Professor Rogers, um, what, what's your thinking on who might be behind this? and? The level of sophistication surely defies anything you've looked at in the past. Well, certainly there was the attempt to destroy the World Trade Center before, and that was a very sophisticated attack. 
What marks this out incredibly is an apparent level of organization within the United States, these simultaneous hijackings and the ability of the groups responsible to take this kind of action. It might have been some kind of international consortium. I agree that it is very unlikely that any state government was involved, not least because of the terrible consequences for such a state. I think it's highly unlikely that the Iranian government would have had anything to do with it. Beyond that, I'm afraid we're into the era of speculation. But the real problem is that it just does show that this kind of event is possible now at a level of, of violence and human impact, which is far greater than most people ever expected. Well, now, uh, let's cross over across the, to the west coast of the United States, where David Smith has been reporting on another assignment. Uh, David, interesting in a way to talk to you as far away from the attack almost as we are, and yet you're in the country. I mean, first of all, are you aware it's even happened in a physical sense in that city? Oh, John, don't for a minute underestimate the, the seismic effect of what's happened here today. Here am I, 3,000 miles away from New York, Washington, D.C., the same distance, and yet virtually the entire city of San Francisco today is closed. There's a limited state of emergency in the city. Uh, the airport is obviously closed. Schools have been closed. The anti-terrorist units have been called out. The Twin Towers of San Francisco, John, the Transamerica building, the Bank of America building, the monuments out here 3,000 miles away, they're closed. Why? Because one of those planes, one of those four planes, was en route from the east to San Francisco, and intelligence officials I gather in Washington just a short time ago now believe that that plane, which crashed near Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, was being directed at Camp David. Camp David, the presidential retreat in Maryland, in the hills of Maryland, the place where Jimmy Carter signed the Middle East Peace Agreement in, 19, in, in the late 70s. Well, now, oh, you, John, you, you can't you, for a minute... You crisscross America on these flights. One of the things which has absolutely foxed everybody is how four, four airliners were hijacked. Um, I mean, American airport security lacks in your mind? Oh, John, the key question is going to be across this society now, and, and when I talk about not underestimating the effect, the seismic effect of what's happened here today, is that this is a country that prides itself on open access. You turn up at an airport, you show them a driving license, they let you on board a plane. They have improved since Lockerbie at the end of the 80s. They have improved uh, security. But it is nowhere near what you and I experience in the rest of the world, typically in the Middle East, typically in Europe these days. Why? Because this culture prides itself on that open access. And one of the things I think you're going to see is, John, you know, the United States from this day forward, uh, politicians are talking about this being the second Pearl Harbor, the d another day of infamy. From this moment on, we're going to see this country not only look at the world and dealing with the world in a totally different way, but also the life it leads at home in terms of security and that open access. But let's look then at George Bush, who so far has had a, 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 a relatively isolationist feel about engagement with the kind of problems that spawn this kind of terrorism. Um, where do we see him going? I mean, missile defense, uh, you know, is it going to lead to greater isolation or an engagement with the rest of us to try and sort the world out? Well, look, first of all, we're watching a president here, John, who, by the way, today has been truly the, uh, on another assignment uh, in another place and has been in the most desperate straits to even get his message out there in terms of defending freedom, which no doubt you showed earlier in the program. The man had to put down in Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana simply to get his message out because there were so many fears about his own personal safety. This is a man who, by and large, turned his back on the Middle East. And by the way, what I judge from talking to an old hand at the State Department this morning who was being evacuated from his office as we spoke, a man who's been a troubleshooter for success administrations for 20 years he immediately wanted to look at the Middle East yes he wanted to look at Osama bin Laden but he immediately thought that this has to be a nexus of groups the like of which we've never seen before and we have a president who in the past seven months is retrenched who very much came into office saying unless the parties to the crisis in the Middle East want to come to the table and solve it themselves we are not going to get involved a, a dramatic uh, u-turn from the Clinton years when we've seen such engagement the questions for Mr. Bush now are extraordinary. Can he step up to this? How does he handle this? Does he turn his back on the world? Does he allow what I suspect will be the innate response of America today to say what on earth is going in the world and what kind of barriers and borders do we have David to throw Smith. up to deal with it? Does Bush play to that or does he go out there and engage the world? David Smith in San Francisco, thank you for joining us. Uh, Abdul Bari Atwan, this is a desperate moment because reprisal must be 
somewhere there. Um, it, the, the, the peace process is disintegrated in Israel. Uh, the Taliban have just, it seems, killed the last opponent to their regime. Um, the whole thing is a tinderbox. You know, reprisal wouldn't guide the American administration anywhere. They, two years ago, uh, they sent their cruise missile to hit Taliban, to hit Osama bin Laden. They missed their target. Osama bin Laden is still there. And they didn't prevent further attacks against the American embassies or American destroyer on Aden. So what's now? What's the, the, I believe the logic reprisal here is to look at the American foreign policy. And the American administration should ask itself why our embassies, only our embassies and our destroyers and our troops and our personnel and our interest attacked all over the world. Why those uh, targeting the American only? Why they are not targeting the Dutch, the Swedish? The why American? Simply because there is something wrong in the American foreign policy. They are a, a blessing what the Israelis are doing, massacring the Palestinians. Big boom, come down the steps, everything fine till we got to the basement and everything just fell in. Uh, I guess on domestic flights in the US has been criticized as insufficient. But experts warn this is a new phase in terrorism. Well, the fact they've infiltrated means that we've got a totally new concept in hijacks. They're just being used as uh, weapons of war. And governments all over the world are know about this. The impact of the attack on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center was magnified by the total collapse of all 110 stories of both sections of the building. The terrorists had succeeded. I asked the American people. So this was all together. You and Dr. Truman, you've only got each other, haven't you? Um, there's several times they've stopped at audacious attempts like this at the last minute or through intelligence operations uh, or indeed through preemptive arrests or preemptive strikes. But the point is with terrorism, as the IRA once said, terrorists only need to be lucky once. Uh, the security forces need to be lucky a hundred times. And one of the issues here really is in terms of civil aviation security in the United States. There's been concern for some time that civil aviation in the US is insecure. Um, it's not possible to check all passengers on flight. It's not possible to close all of air, all airspace over sensitive areas. So there certainly have been advocates in the US security community saying that this is a disaster waiting to happen because US uh, domestic airlines are so easy to hijack. Unfortunately, they may well now have been proved right. New Yorkers today witness the price of a free society. To stop terrorists taking advantage of that freedom could be all but impossible. Lawrence McGinty, ITN. Let's go to James Mates in Washington. James, how are things developing there in Washington, D.C. tonight? Well, we have a situation here where the president and his security advisers feel unable to return to Washington to take command of this situation. The White House and all its staff have been evacuated. The Pentagon, I'm sure you can still see the smoke there coming from it behind me, is effectively out of commission. 24,000 people evacuated from there. President Bush was in Florida. He has taken up his headquarters at the headquarters of the uh, Eighth Air Force in uh, Louisiana, part of the Strategic Command Center set up to, uh, to run the country in the event of a nuclear war. From there, he has complete control over the American military. Two uh, aircraft uh, carrier battle groups have been dispatched from Norfolk, Virginia to patrol uh, the east coast of the United States. Uh, but that is where the traveling White House is tonight. It is, of course, uh, mid-afternoon there on the American east coast. Um, the ramifications will undoubtedly have spread across the whole of America. Is there a sense in which America is right now paralyzed by the shock of these events? It is physically paralyzed. Manhattan obviously closed down. All air traffic has been closed down. Many of the major roads on the East Coast have been closed down. Uh, much of the federal government has been closed down. A quite unprecedented situation. Washington, D.C. for now. Thank you. Well, as yet, it's not clear who carried out the attacks, but the finger of blame is pointed firmly at the Middle East. Some Palestinians celebrated what they saw as a blow against Israel's strongest ally. But their leader, Yasser Arafat, condemned the terrorism. Experts are suggesting the blame may lie with the Islamic warlord Osama bin Laden and the international terrorist network that he runs from his base in Afghanistan. Here's Ross Childs. Joy in Jerusalem today. In a traditional gesture of celebration, Palestinian demonstrators throw free sweets to children as news of the terror attacks in the United States comes through. 
Many Palestinians accuse America of siding with Israel as tensions in the Middle East grow. But today, Palestinian President Yasser Arafat distanced himself from the events in New York and in Washington. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. High on the list of prime suspects is Osama bin Laden. He's the world's most wanted terrorist, a man who's pledged himself to conducting a bloody war against America. But Afghanistan's Taliban movement, who have given bin Laden refuge, today denied that he's responsible. Bin Laden and his Al-Qud organization has been linked to several bombings against U.S. targets. In 1993, the World Trade Center was again hit by a massive bomb blast that killed six people. Just last year, a suicide bomb attack hit the warship USS Cole in Aden. Then 17 sailors died. And in 1998, American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were bombed, killing 224 people. They attacked our embassies in Africa. The, 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 uh, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But before you make any drastic decisions about retaliation, I think you have to make sure you have compelling evidence that it was the Al-Qaeda or, or organization. And there are other suspects. Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, whose agents were charged with the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 that exploded over Lockerbie, is also a possible perpetrator as is Saddam Hussein, leader of Iraq, whose airspace is still being policed by U.S. jets. Until today, this was the worst act of terrorism on U.S. soil, the bombing in 1995 of the federal building in Oklahoma. Middle East extremists were also suspected, but it was a former U.S. soldier, Timothy McVeigh, who was responsible. The hunt is now on to bring those behind today's attacks to justice. Ros Childs, ITN. Look, you've just joined us, an update on the appalling attacks today in the United States. Four passenger planes were hijacked and crashed deliberately into some of America's most high-profile landmarks. The first hit one of the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York, just as its 50,000 workers were starting their day. Then, with the building already ablaze, a second jet like the others, a hijacked domestic American plane collided with the building's other tower. Well, the effect was awful and inevitable. First one, then the other tower collapsed, spreading a pall of smoke and debris that covered all of New York. Washington was also targeted when another plane crashed into the Pentagon. The number of dead in that attack and the attacks in New York as yet unknown, but it's feared they may run into thousands. Well, the terrorists' actions were greeted here with shock and outrage. Tony Blair cancelled a speech he was due to give at the Trades Union Conference and rushed back for emergency meetings in Downing Street. He said that mass terrorism was the new evil facing the world and the threat caused chaos in the city of London today as the stock exchange and other buildings were evacuated. Here's John Ray. It was a sombre Prime Minister who rushed back to Downing Street late this afternoon to coordinate Britain's response to the crisis. He denounced the terrorist attacks as the new evil facing the world. This is not a battle between the United States of America and terrorism, but between the free and democratic world and terrorism. We therefore here in Britain stand shoulder to shoulder with our American friends in this hour of tragedy, and we, like them, will not rest until this evil is driven from our world. Britain is America's closest ally and senior ministers at the Cabinet's Emergency Committee, COBRA, not only agreed to tighten security at home, at airports, at military bases and government buildings, but also discussed America's likely response to the outrage. For the Conservatives, William Hague, delaying his party's leadership contest by 24 hours, urged Britain to support the US. Whoever has committed these atrocities has committed a monstrous act of war against the civilized world. 
And of course, the thoughts of all of us in Britain are with the families of the people who have been injured or killed, and of course, they could be huge in number. Our heartfelt sympathies go out to all those who have been affected, injured, and tragically killed by this demented act of evil that we have witnessed over the past few hours in the United States. In a global economy, the terrorist threat is also global. In the city of London, many high-profile firms, some with offices in New York, evacuated staff. It was only a precaution, but tonight they too are being issued with new advice on heightening security. John Ray, ITN, Westminster. Well, Joe Andrews is in Downing Street. Joe, um, no surprise there that the Prime Minister is standing absolutely firm with the US. No, no surprise there at all. I think it's a very interesting message, and I think it's being given really on two levels. On one level, saying to the American people, yes, we're here, yes, you can have access to our intelligence if you need our military bases, yes, we will do everything we can to try to help you track these people down. But there's another layer of this message. Remember that after George Bush was elected, he looked very much like a president who wanted to isolate America, who wanted to say, let's concentrate on the problems at home. Let's have nothing to do with the world outside. Potentially the most isolationist regime America has seen since the Second World War. Well, in a sense, that's all over. And here's Tony Blair saying to George Bush, you can't cut yourself off. No nation is an island. The world is a global world. This kind of thing happens to you. And if it does, here we are. We're willing to help. You need your friends. You need your allies. Here's Britain. Moving to the practicalities more immediate, what more can you tell us about the security precautions in this country? Well, certainly the security precautions in all the government buildings have been tightened up. No private aircraft to fly, civil aircraft not to fly over central London. The Cabinet Committee to meet again at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to review those precautions. Joe Andrews, live from Downing Street, thanks for joining us. Well, if you've recently switched on, we're on the air with a special program on the awful and extraordinary events unfolding today across the Atlantic. America fell victim to the modern nightmare, mass terrorist murder. Their weapons, four hijacked passenger planes. The first crashed into one of the twin towers of New York's famous World Trade Center, setting it ablaze. Then about 20 minutes later, the second plane hove into view and smashed into the other tower. Well, the terrible power and force of its impact was clear on the streets of New York. Utter chaos as the workers fled the area. 50,000 people worked in the World Trade Center every day. Now, the inevitable consequence of the plane strikes was the collapse of one of America's most symbolic landmarks. First one tower fell in on itself, and then the other, trapping, of course, untold numbers of people inside. The Pentagon, the heart of American security and power, was the next target. Another plane crash set the building ablaze and caused parts to collapse. A fourth plane crashed in Pennsylvania. Well, as the smoke engulfed New York's famous skyline, the message from the bombers was clear. No place in America is safe, and no symbol of its power is sacred. Well, we're going back now to our Washington correspondent, James Mates. James, your final thoughts this evening. Well, we are in a situation tonight where the federal government has been closed down here in Washington, D.C. The financial heart of the United States in Manhattan is closed, too. The terrorists have spectacularly succeeded in what they've tried to do, but at horrendous cost in human lives. The New York Police Department speak of thousands dead, no reason to believe they're exaggerating. To put this in perspective, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, not quite two and a half thousand people died. Today, the figures could be higher, very possibly much higher. We await the response from the president, both in words and actions. He'll be under pressure to take action, but I don't think he'll need much encouragement. Thank you, James. That's it for now. We'll be back on air with another TV news ITV news special. That's at 9 this evening with Trevor McDonald. From me, goodbye.
There are several program changes tonight because of today's terrorist attacks in America, and there'll be an ITV News special, as you may have heard, at 9. But now, who wants to be a millionaire?